Now we're going to hear about hothouse earth and how to avoid it from um, Will Steffen. So Will Steffen is a professor emeritus in the School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University. He is a recognized global authority on human impacts on the earth system. And he served as executive director of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program based in Sweden. He is a counselor at the Climate Institute and was advisor to the Australian government on climate change. And he's going to tell us about hot house earth and how to avoid it. My name is Will Steffen and I'm an earth system scientist. Today I want to talk about the concept or I should say the risk or threat of hothouse earth and what we can do to avoid it. Those of us who live in Eastern Australia got a glimpse of what hothouse earth might look like a bit over a year ago. Uh, this photo was taken in the southern suburbs of Canberra, where I live, in January 2020. You can see uh, that hothouse earth is looming on the horizon there. In fact, at that point, uh, quite a few suburbs in Canberra were on alert to evacuate. Uh, should those flames come down. Fortunately, we had, we had a wind shift and avoided it. But much of Eastern Australia didn't avoid the catastrophe of the mega fires of 2019 and 2020. They are just a glimpse of what might be in store if we actually do go on to a hothouse earth trajectory. What does that look like? First of all, we need to look at what's happening to the planet as a whole. A good metric for doing that is global average surface temperature, that is the surface of the planet over the land, over the ocean and over ice. And what we can see here is that the earth is warming exceptionally rapidly. This is the observed increase in global temperatures. These are measurements, they're not model projections. And we can see from the middle of the 20th century and certainly from the 1960s or 70s has been an exceptionally rapid rise in temperature. In fact, over the past decade or two, that rate has been accelerating. We need to compare it uh, against the background rate uh, of the Earth itself. And to do that, we can go back to ice core data and look at what we call the Holocene reference point. Uh, it's important that we do this because the nature and rate of changes we're seeing are actually geologically significant. So the last approximately 11,700 years I've circled here is called the Holocene. It's a period of temperature and, and climate and environmental stability in a relative sense um, compared to the Ice Age and the transition that went before it. This is important for humanity because it's only during this 11,700 year period that we've been able to develop agriculture, villages, larger settlements, uh, and the uh, technologically uh, advanced societies that we uh, understand and live in today. But that now is under threat as the temperature rises past one degree and towards two degrees. I should add here as a reference point, uh, the difference between an ice age and a warm period is actually about four degrees in global average temperature. It's eight here because this is a polar ice core record from Antarctica and there's a polar amplification fact. So already we have raised the temperature over a quarter of the way uh, of, of between an ice age and a warm period, but of course in the opposite direction. So when we look at the last 2000 years of the Holocene, it looks like this, and there is natural variability, uh, but it's in a very narrow band of about a tenth of a degree above and below the average. Uh, and there's been an exceptionally slow cooling trend, and that's due to orbital parameters of Earth, until this uh, last century or so, when a very rapid spike uh, of the, of the human-driven climate change appears on the record. So again, this is now on a much longer time frame. This is that graph I showed you of the observed temperature rise now sitting at about 1.1 degree above pre-industrial. This is why we're getting exceptional weather. This is why ecosystems can't cope. This is why coral reefs are bleaching. This rate and magnitude is well outside anything experienced during the Holocene. If we look at the climate model projections uh, out to the end of this century, these are from the IPCC fifth assessment report, uh, ranging from a low emission scenario to a high emission scenario, uh, we can then map these projected temperature rises on that same 2000 year plot. So there's the 2000 year plot. Where we're sitting today is about here where my cursor is. 
2100, there's 1900, there's 2000. So 2100 is about here. So to give you an idea of how dramatic these temperature rises actually will be, that's what the IPCC projections look like on a 2000 year temperature record. So here's where we sit today at the end of this black line of observations at about 1.1 degrees above the pre-industrial level, which is usually measured as 1850 to 1900, somewhere back here. But when we look at where we might be going in the future, the climate uh, targets of the Paris Agreement sit somewhere between one and a half and two degrees. They're in this zone here. If we just continue on the current trajectory by 2100, we would be three degrees or perhaps even a bit more above pre-industrial. The worst case trajectory, uh, the high emission trajectory, could take us all the way up to four degrees or above. Uh, and that is a completely new state of the Earth system, one that we haven't uh, seen for millions of years. And it certainly would be a challenge to contemporary civilization. I've written here possible collapse. I could easily put probable collapse uh, for that type of scenario. But really what I want to talk, now, talk about now are the risks that we might, even if we try to keep temperature in here, end up there because of the internal dynamics of the Earth's system. There are things that we call tipping points in the Earth's system. I'll explain them in much more detail in a few minutes. But we think the risk of starting these tipping points tipping over lies somewhere between a degree and a half and up to three degrees. We're almost sure we'll be tipping a lot of them. So the problem there is once you start tipping these uh, elements of the Earth's system on their own, they will take you another one and a half or two degrees hotter. In other words, put you in the exceptionally high danger zone. So really for us humans, the danger zone is actually lying down in here where the Paris targets lie. We did a, a paper in 2018 trying to analyze uh, what this, uh, this risk of tipping points might look like. And we used a thing called a stability diagram where we look at very stable states of the Earth system. This is an ice age here. This is an interglacial or the Holocene here. And the Earth over the last um, half a million to million years have been oscillating between glacial and interglacial cycles. So the Holocene is up here, but we've already pushed the Earth system out of the Holocene. It's no longer there. It's accelerating away in a, 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 an epoch that we are now calling the Anthropocene. So in the year 2021, we are sitting here at a very close to a fork in the road uh, where the trajectory of the Earth system May, uh, may get out of our control. So our current trajectory is toward this planetary threshold and toward what we call hothouse Earth. That's what we're on now. The tipping cascade that I'll talk about in just a moment appears on this diagram as a threshold, a cliff, a waterfall, whatever you want to use as an analogy, where once the Earth system gets sliding down towards it, there will be a point of no return where it goes across this threshold and into what we call hothouse Earth. This other trajectory, which uh, we're running out of time to get onto, uh, but I think we still can if we really get our act together. This embodies the climate, uh, Paris climate targets and the bias and biosphere restoration. In other words, stopping the degradation of the biosphere and restoring it. This could lead to a, a state we call stabilized Earth, which would be hotter than the Holocene, but we could be able to park it in this little valley that we create through our activities that keep us away from hothouse Earth. But let me go now into a bit of detail about what this tipping cascade, this planetary threshold might actually look like in reality. We know a lot, a lot now about tipping points in the Earth system. They come in three different types, melting of ice, which occurs obviously in the polar regions, uh, also in the high Himalaya and the permafrost regions. Changes in circulation in the ocean, this is the North Atlantic uh, thermohaline or Atlantic thermohaline circulation, colloquially called the Gulf Stream up in this part of the world. But of course, for us here in Australia, and so are El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a coupled atmosphere ocean circulation system is exceptionally important. And big biome loss like the Amazon rainforest or the boreal forest. Those are types of, of systems that when they are pushed to a certain point, they tip into another state. Uh, in other words, they, they oftentimes go through abrupt change. Sometimes it's irreversible. Um, in any case, it's a nonlinear change. We, can, we also know that these are linked and can lead to what we call tipping cascades. So that like a row of dominoes, if you start tipping the first couple dominoes, you can get the whole row to tip, tip over. Let me explain very quickly what one of these might look like. We already know that uh, Arctic summer sea ice 
uh, is uh, decreasing quite rapidly. We also know that the Green Greenland ice sheet is losing ice at an increasing rate. Uh, and what this is doing is it's pouring more fresh water onto the North Atlantic Ocean. This is starting to change the thermohaline circulation. It's slowing down. This is reducing rainfall over the Amazon forest and it's burning more frequently. So here we have a case of where what's happening at the North Pole is affecting what's happening at the equator through this, this cascade, this linkage between these individual tipping elements. So we're worried that there could become a global tipping cascade that would take the Earth system as a whole into another state. The IPCC in its special report on the 1.5 Paris target already said there's a moderate risk of large scale singular events, that's their jargon for tipping points, uh, at a one degree temperature rise and a moderate to high risk at 2.5 degrees of warming. So this period between one and particularly between 1.5 and 2.5 or three is an exceptionally important uh, uh, phase in, in climate change. One that we want to avoid, uh, I think, if we possibly can. In terms of this global tipping cascade, a group of us did an analysis that was published in 2019 to say where are we now in terms of these tipping points. As I mentioned, Arctic sea ice is reducing, Greenland ice sheets accelerating, Atlantic circulation is, slow down, is slowing down, boreal forest is, is burning more often, West Antarctica is losing ice, coral reefs, as we know in Australia, there's already been large-scale die-offs. They're occurring more frequently now. And interestingly, one we thought was stable, at least in the Wilkes Basin in East Antarctica, we're starting to see accelerating ice loss, which is really quite a big concern. So the point we're making here is this global tipping cascade is not something fanciful uh, that a small group of scientists have dreamt up. Uh, this is something that we can actually see starting to move today at a 1.1 degree temperature rise. So a quote from that paper I think is very important. If damaging tipping cascades can occur, and we're pretty certain they can, and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this indeed is an existential threat to civilization. No amount of economic cost benefit analysis is going to help us. So that's the state of the science uh, now in terms of tipping points, tipping cascades, and I think a rapidly growing risk that we could lose control of the system. Another way to look at this uh, in terms of a climate emergency is an engineering approach, which is to say, what is um, the reaction time to stop the warming of the planet, but what is the intervention time to stopping these tipping points? So let me just run you through very quickly what this looks like. So let's say that the reaction time to net zero emissions is 2050, 30 years from now. Now that's a very popular target. Many countries are adopting net zero by 2050. But let me explain why this is actually a dangerous target. What are the intervention times to stop this, kicking, uh, this, this tipping cascade from starting? Okay, Arctic sea ice, it's probably zero. In fact, we are virtually at the tipping point. Some people think we've already crossed it and we may already be committed to having an ice-free uh, Arctic Ocean a few decades down the track. West Antarctic, maybe 10 years before we start tipping that and losing West Antarctica becomes irreversible. That's about another three meters of sea level rise embodied there. Amazon forest, maybe 15 years. Uh, given the Bolsonaro government, if they keep deforesting at the rate they are, that could move that up to 10 years or so. So there's interaction here between direct human impact on ecosystems and what the tipping point might be based on climate change. Greenland ice sheet, uh, we're not at a tipping point yet. 25 years is maybe optimistic. We may hit that before that. But notice that all of these are before the 30 years. All of these are before net zero by 2050. And this on these on their own might be enough to start a tipping cascade. So we are indeed in dangerous territory. And as we noted in that 2019 paper, are we already losing control of the system? Uh, so there are, there are some very serious concerns that 2050 is far, far too late and we need to ramp up action much more vigorously than that. Just a very quick note on the direct human impact on the biosphere. This is important for climate, but it's important for the stability of the planet in its own right. There was a big assessment equivalent to the IPCC on the biosphere that was published in 2019. Many important conclusions from that. I'll only give you three. Nature is now declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, and that's because of direct human degradation. Around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. 
the web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. Uh, and there's no there's no controversy about this. We all understand this really well. The evidence is overwhelming. So here we have a double whammy of a rapidly destabilizing physical climate system and a rapidly degrading biosphere. What do we do about this? Well, there are some interesting ideas out there, but we're going to have to move very quickly and decisively. One of the best is Kate Rayworth, who has what she calls a donut economics approach, uh, where we need to look at this so-called environmental ceiling. These are the nine planetary boundaries, and we're already greatly exceeding biodiversity loss. We're already greatly exceeding climate change and many of the other ones, freshwater use, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and so on. But we also need to develop a completely different type of economy that deals with equality and equity, resilience, education, uh, food, water, health is very important. And we're far away from that in our current education system. I'll just put three of her main points of what an economy for the 21st century needs to look like. We need systems thinking, not linear cause effect. We have to get out of GDP thinking and think about dynamic complexity. Equity, our system should be distributed by design, biosphere, it should be regenerative, not exploitative by design. So our current uh, neoliberal economic system is exactly the opposite of what we actually need. I'm gonna conclude now about why we are truly in an emergency. This is what the observed emission profile looks like from 1850 to 2019. So these are total emissions in uh, billion tons or gigatons of carbon dioxide. Notice that it's been growing exponentially, 1.65% increase per year. But notice here where, where science has come in in terms of detection of the warming signal, IPCC assessments, and so on. And here's policy, Kyoto, Paris. None of this has had any demonstrable effect yet on the emission reduction curve. The only thing that really has has been the global financial crisis and COVID. And of course, they were not, uh, not designed activities that were meant to reduce emissions. Here's what the pathway uh, looks like for meeting the upper Paris target. This is the so-called well below two or, or, or close to two actually. Uh, and this is already dangerous territory, but to meet it now, we're in 2020, here's what we need to do. At least a 50% reduction by 2030, more would be better. And at a minimum net zero by 2040. But look, if we delay only five years, it becomes impossible. We need to totally decarbonize in 10 years. So this is really, uh, really an emergency situation. So our emergency is here. We have no time left before we start a deep emission reduction, uh, emission redu reduction trajectory. This is indeed a climate emergency. The students are indeed right. So what is the COVID-19 type response? We talk about flattening the curve in terms of of um, the transmission of COVID-19. What do we have to do to flatten the curve in terms of climate change? Well, the first thing is no new fossil fuel developments of any kind. We must stop the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. That means coal, oil, and importantly for Australia, gas. So a gas-led recovery out of COVID is completely senseless, completely crazy in terms of dealing with a climate change issue. So I said before, we need at least a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And that means we need to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030 or preferably before 2030. Actually, that can be done technologically and economically, but politics and vested interests are getting in the way. As I said, reach net zero emissions by 2040 or before. These are sort of, uh, of, of drop dead deadlines. We have to meet these. So just to conclude, if you recall that, um, that stability landscape diagram, that earth floating around in the landscape, we are at that fork in the road now. It's not in 2025. It's definitely not in 2030. It's now. We have to take the right actions and the right decisions now if we want to avoid uh, a climate tragedy. So I'm going to stop there um, and hopefully uh, you'll have some good discussion. Apologies that I cannot be uh, live in, in the meeting. I've got other commitments, uh, but I hope this gives you an earth system science background of why we are indeed in emergency status. Thank you very much. So that was uh, quite
quite a depressing talk, I thought, by uh, Will Steven. <laughs> um, and as he uh, mentioned at the end, he is not able to join us. So we're going to uh, do a debate again, where I, I will invite you to all unmute yourselves. Um, and you don't need to uh, to wait for my invitation. Please go ahead and unmute yourselves. So um, the first question I want to ask is, um, does anybody else feel a bit of climate despair? And how does everybody uh, deal with it? Um, it's the idea basically that it's too late already uh, and that whatever we might do uh, won't be enough to affect real change. Um, so I think it, it, can, it can become uh, quite easy to uh, to just think, well, it's too late. Um, so how, how have people found interesting ways of coping with this? Uh, is this a, se a sentiment that others uh, are familiar with? And, uh, and are there any ideas out there on how to combat it? Yes, you don't need to raise your hand, just go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gilkson. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with basically everything which Will Stefan has said. I would only add one comment that at this stage, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has already reached um, 412, but the equivalent together jointly with other greenhouse gases is close to 500. Now, at this level, uh, amplifying feedbacks are triggered, which means once the atmosphere reaches up this level of carbon dioxide and higher temperature, a number of processes are activated on the Earth, which includes warming of the ocean, which expels some of the carbon dioxide, release of methane from the Arctic bogs, and um, a number of other processes which increases the uh, release emission of carbon dioxide, which means it becomes a self-perpetuating process. Uh, yes, it, becomes that, it, becomes, that. it becomes irreversible when, when it reaches up this level. Now, civilization and most uh, media um, voices are talking about reduced emission. Of course, we need to reduce emission. We need to reduce it right down to zero if possible. But the level of carbon dioxide, of amplifying feedbacks, uh, of gas trapping, um, heat trapping gases is already such that it's activating amplifying feedbacks. What can be done? Well, in theory, in principle, uh, the need, we need to draw down uh, sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at the fastest rate we can. Now, this requires enormous uh, investment, trillions of investment. These very trillions that do exist, but they are currently channeled into the military, they channel into further destruction. Uh, so the, something has to be, has to happen to wake up the powers to be so-called, to stop uh, preparing for the next war or nuclear war and invest in down draw sequestration. And there are a number of methods which can do it, but whether they will decide to uh, save the atmosphere and life on Earth or not, this is up to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So a good strategy to fight climate despair with action. Uh, I think that's, that's always good <laughs> uh, because when you throw yourself into action, uh, then you, you can't, you can't, you, there's no time you can't afford to be pessimistic when you do that sort of, uh, you know, action-oriented uh, method to cope. So we have interesting comments from Gordon Weiss and from Ashley Colby. Would you like to unmute yourselves and explain what you've been saying in the chat about climate despair? Um, oh, thank you. Yes, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't intending to say any more. No, my experience of, of younger people is that is that there's a there's a dangerous ennui that sets in because they're so overwhelmed by the notion of climate change they've given up on the future. Uh, so I think we need to do everything in our power, those of us who have seen this terrible slide in the last half century, to try and stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And Ashley, I think you also have a, a good strategy to deal with climate despair. Sure, yeah. Um, I have moved through this um, 
psychological space of what we might call doomerism for quite a while. And it takes time, I think, for, um, for people to psychologically process what's happening. Um, in my case, though, I moved on to become what I just recently called myself a doomer optimist, um, which basically means I think we have no option but to figure out these solutions. And so my day-to-day -day life is that uh, researching, teaching, um, communicating solutions. Um, many of them are just being tested out. We don't know for sure, but at least doing the work of figuring it out is extremely invigorating. And I'm surrounded by other people similar to myself. Um, so yeah, I think I, I'm very hopeful from that work. <laughs> Excellent, that's very encouraging as well. Um, so uh, maybe we should talk about one of the solutions that Will Steven mentioned, which is the donut. Um, so James, if you wouldn't mind showing us the donut. Um, is anybody familiar with that model? And could anyone explain it further? Or do you want to explain uh, you know, what you understood about this model and how it could help? Oh, somebody knows the donut. I think it's Tom. Tom, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I, uh, yes, the donut idea has been around for a long time. Kate did a great, a great thing by codifying it. It basically combines the planetary limits with a global social floor you can understand in terms of a broad human rights agenda. It's basically an equity-based global uh, deal regime. Um, and uh, it, it's a very high level way of thinking about the problem. It, it, it doesn't lend itself to, to uh, operationalization, though, as, as Professor Stefan said, it, it, it implies a, re a focus on regeneration and redistribution. And, and I, I think that it is apropos at this point in the conversation because um, regeneration and redistribution in particular have to be highlighted. Otherwise, it really is impossible to imagine getting out of this predicament. Um, so yeah, that is, that is very relevant. What the point I wanted to make was that, um, th that we, are, we need to understand that it is not too late and that we, the, the climate negotiations in particular are in a, a key moment right now and that, uh, and that the Paris regime could work but it is going to require a lot of international finance, um, which connects right back to the donut, because as you'll recall, redistribution is, is key to donut economics. Um, it's, it's just absolutely essential that the ambition mechanisms in the Paris Agreement be activated. This is the year when the international pledges have to be radically strengthened. Um, this, the, if, if people are in, uh, are up to date with the climate negotiations, they know that around the world, people, nations, that is to say, not people, excuse me, nations are making net zero 2050 pledges, but by and large, those net zero 2050 pledges are not achievable without a terrific amount of international financial and technological support. And so, it's, it's what's, the, what's the solution? Yeah, activism is the solution, but we also have to be very clear about the fact that we have to act in a, in a manner that is primarily based on justice and, and, and spotlights the necessity for global cooperation. Excellent. Thank you so much for your input, Tom. I think, Ian, you'd like to ask a question, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, thank you. Um, if I could just make a comment. You asked the question about how do we handle the um, concerns about it being too late. I mean, the fundamental problem is that um, we still do not have a clear understanding of the types of risks that Will Stefan has outlined in the international discussions that are going on. I mean, whether you look at governments, you look at corporations, you look at investors, and certainly in the general community, we have refused to talk about, <coughs> pardon me, refused to talk about the problem honestly, 
and the in the lead up to the COP discussions, there is no sign that, that is changing. I mean, we everybody is congratulating themselves at the moment within the corporate investment world um, on committing to net zero emissions by 2050. As Will says, it has to be achieved um, by 2040. Uh, in my view, it has to be achieved before that. But the fact is that what we need is to open up a conversation which honestly discusses these points because at the moment, nobody understands it. Either they, uh, either they don't want to, or they've never been exposed to the information that Will has outlined. Now that has to change. And I think one of the functions of these types of uh, meetings is that that discussion needs to be brought right out into the, into the public arena, not in the sense of it being uh, doom and you know, gloom and what have you, but in the sense of it just honestly saying, this is what we have to do. We can't do it with the existing systems. The UN process is not going to deliver. Um, and we have to completely reframe the approaches we're using. Now, I mean, we know the types of solutions. I mean, the donut is, is certainly one of them. But what you're talking about is, the, is the, the type of response you have in a wartime situation. I mean, you just have to say, look, there is one issue above all else that we have to address. It is climate, and if we don't get on top of that, I know there are a lot of other major issues, but this one is absolutely fundamental. Mm. We have to address it, and the other point we have to take is we need to take precautionary steps uh, to ensure that we don't move in, into that hot house earth arena. Mm. Um, so, you know, the, the, the reframing of this is absolutely crucial. Thank you so much, Ian. So we're nearly... I think we're over time actually. Uh, Paolo, do you want to quickly uh, tell us your thoughts? Uh, you're on mute. Uh, let, if I have a little time, let me, the last speaker, Jan Dunlop, talk about reframe. The question is to talk about something that nobody, no, nobody one talks, that is the legal status of climate. Uh, climate uh, in Paris Agreement since 19, 1982 is a common concern of mankind. This means that nobody knows until today what is a concern, what are their rights and duties that arise from a concern. A concern means that we are worried about something, but we do not have recognized stable climate. The function, the, the earth system function in the in a stable way is not a common good for international law. Without making this uh, evolution, we will be always like this because, for example, the, the, the reason why to make less emissions is generate credits, as uh, I think you saw that uh, uh, Elon Musk, for example, earned, earned more, uh, more money selling credits of CO2 than selling cars, and who are cleaning the atmosphere with forests do not earn nothing. Without changing this, we have no redistribution, we will keep the same way, and we are playing a negative sum game. That is, to have credits, we, we must have emissions, and to have economic value in the forest, we must have emissions. We have, we have forests, and to make negative emissions, nobody pays because we are making a benefit for all mankind, and this is a legal void in, in international law. To clean the atmosphere today is to make a benefit in the legal voice. And nobody talks about this. And without solving this problem, we have no framework to collective actions. We have no frame, framework to clean, to clean our most important global common, that is the system. Okay, that's an interesting view uh, of how we could use the tools at our disposal to affect change. Uh, such as uh, legal change, regulatory change, all the things that we already have, but maybe we're not using efficiently yet. Right, so thank you so much everyone for participating in the debate.